Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 100. And my guest in this episode is Nikos Patadakis, and this is a part two. And there will be information to find Nikos' work on the internet down below in the description field. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I'm going to put a link to the first conversation at where you can access that if you wish to watch that prior to this one. So enjoy. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome the audience to the IdeaCast interview series. Um, I have my guest, and I'm blurring again, uh, Nikos Patidakis. And this is our part two, which is why I'm welcoming you all, because Nikos and I are just in our conversation. We're, we're in a space together, uh, hashing out some thoughts and ideas. Nikos has a PhD in philosophy. I'm general audience, so I am asking him the best questions I can, getting good information from him and extracting wisdom uh, from what he knows on his own and what he has in his background. So, Nikos, welcome back again for part two. So glad to have you here. Great to be here. Feeling comfortable. We've been warming, <laughs> up, warming up the wisdom whistle. Yes, we did. And, yes, uh, we did. Yes. All right. So perhaps for part two, uh, there was something in my researching your work, and um, I have the opportunity to speak to somebody that has a love for the love of wisdom, a, a, a meta philo for, for wisdom. Um, when in our modern times, or our meta modern times, um, we know about the psyche, perhaps a little more dynamically or a little little more differently than perhaps during the axial age or, or any time prior to uh, maybe the early 19th century when psychology and psychiatry started to, to get on its feet and start going. What I would like to ask of you is that when we um, practice in good faith the wisdom traditions or when we try to share the wisdom from wisdom traditions with others, <clears throat> I want to account for the diversity of the psyche, both good and bad, and the um, just our nature as it is expressed through through whatever format of psyche or whatever configuration of psyche that we have. So again, we we uh, reference narcissism earlier. There are personality types. There are um, depressives. There are anxious people. There are people like me who can be neurotic sometimes. Um, so when we speak to these truths as faith in a um, practice, how can we be both generalized and uh, specialized in the um, apprehension of these wisdom traditions as a, a very diverse population? I, I don't know if that's a bizarre wandering question, but to speak more concisely that we are a, a very diverse uh, population in terms of our psyche and, and how we express ourselves. Does that matter? Does it matter? Hmm. Um, so perhaps let me, let me use a, for instance, maybe a, maybe a, a person who is not on the healthy end of narcissism is going to be in that delusional state of, you know, I'm fine. It's the world that's screwed up and, and I'm in control and, and I know what's best for me and and I'm going to tell you what's best for you you know I mean that kind of self-deception is a barrier to uh the inroads that could be made through the wisdom traditions and I'm sorry to pick on anybody who's in I mean, you know, we all have narcissism to varying degrees but um that's an example so I'll stop and 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 see where you want to take that whoa that is a big question one thing that I would say first of all there's a couple of things to say okay one is Jung is an incredibly insightful psychologist. Mm -hmm. Just wow. You know, you don't have to be a Jungian to... I, I, every time I read Jung, I just think, wow, this dude is so great. Yeah. He pales in comparison to Buddha as a psychologist. And that's just, that's just I think that's pretty, pretty clear. And okay. so one of the things that your question reflects is that we, we do in, in the dominant culture tend to think if we haven't figured out what the mind is, or we only really started figuring out in the past hundred years, you know, nobody else did either. Yeah, but maybe they did. And, and I think 
the most holistic, comprehensive, and satisfying account for understanding the mind in what we can call both its encumbered mm -hmm. or limited uh, delusional neurotic states and its liberated states and how to get there is really the Buddhist philosophical traditions in particular, but not exclusive to them because all philosophers, this is the other thing I would say, uh, Jung and Freud, every major form of psychotherapy that we have has roots in the wisdom traditions because the wisdom traditions, that is their purview. What is a human being? What is their nature? What's the nature of reality? And how do you know reality and become liberated? skillful, healthy, vitalizing, loving, happy, peaceful. Those are all questions of the psyche. Mm -hmm. And Freud and Jung were open about the fact that they were influenced by the ancient Greeks, by Nietzsche, who is also an incredible psychologist, really a good psychologist. And they were so influenced. Freud said I, he had to stop reading Nietzsche at a certain point because he said, you know, it just would have taken over everything mm -hmm. because you, he's this is a genius Who's, mm -hmm. who's holding court about what's what's the nature of mind and culture. And so those traditions, then Adler was also influenced by Nietzsche. Viktor Frankl was influenced by Nietzsche. So logotherapy, individual, mm -hmm. all these therapies from the Greeks. And then Jung, of course, <clears throat> the Gnostics, who, who consider themselves sons of Sophia, that same Sophia that Plato said we're supposed to love. Mm -hmm. So philosophia, the Gnostics were sons of Sophia. Uh, uh, pardon me, the alchemists. The alchemists were sons of Sophia. Uh, the Gnostics were uh, Christian philosophers, uh, Christian mystics. So he was influenced by the Gnostics and the alchemists. I hope that wasn't confusing anybody because I misspoke. But then what did you have? The next big rev revolution was CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Aaron Beck is open about the fact that he was trained as a psychoanalyst, started to see limitations in it. And then he went to the Stoics. He said, well, I remember studying the Stoics when I was in, you know, an undergraduate. Well, let me see if there's things that could help. And so he and Albert Ellis developed this protocol. Now, notice, why did that happen? Why did you get Freud, then Jung, then Adler, and this these very different psychologies, and then Aaron Beck? Why are these things so different? Well, I would argue because they made the mistake of not studying the wisdom traditions holistically. And when you fail to do that, you're going to get fragments of wisdom that will work to help people but you will lose some things and then so then here's aaron beck he's only got the fragments that freud was able to collect and also you know think through himself and he wasn't the kind of psychonaut you know we have astronauts but we have psychonauts like buddha and plato and socrates who went into the mind and then explored it and so Freud wasn't as skilled a psychonaut as Buddha or, or Socrates. And so he's only going to give you pieces. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the same cartography of the soul. And so that's part of the reason why we have a proliferation of therapies in the dominant culture is because each one takes a little bit. Oh, let's have a little bit of stoicism. Not let's have a holistic philosophy of life, but mm -hmm. let me show you how to feel better right now by telling you what you should think, mm -hmm. which is kind of the way it functions in practice. Okay, you've got an irrational belief. Do you understand that? Let me explain to you why it's irrational. This is what you should believe instead. Mm -hmm. Then the next revolution is the humanistic. That goes back to the existentialists again. They start rereading Nietzsche because he's so rich. And you also get them reading the Taoists and Eastern philosophy starts to inform it. But then that doesn't even compare um, so that's humanistic and transpersonal. But the real, real influx of Buddhist philosophy has created the biggest revolution so far. It's affected not only the all, all the therapies that are compassion-based, mindfulness-based. You have all this mindfulness-based therapies. And even, say, a traditional psychoanalyst might start to practice mindfulness, so influencing everything. But it also started to influence our neuroscience and our mm. cognitive science. We started to say, wait a second. Let's put these people in a brain scan or something is going on mm -hmm. that we don't see in anybody in our population. Mm. Something about the practice of philosophy does things that we can hardly believe. And when I say that, I mean it literally. I often tell the story of going to a conference and seeing Richie Davidson, one of the major researchers uh, in this. And he was talking about how when they ran one of their experiments and they found they found this incredible gamma burst activity, he said, we thought we were at first scared because we thought the EEG machine might be broken mm -hmm. because we had never seen an EEG machine do that. Right. But it kept doing it again and again every time we hooked these guys up and we'd hook different people up and it would still do it. We'd hook ordinary people up and it was seemed to be operating normally but didn't do the gamma yeah. burst. Yeah. It really blew them away. Yeah. So 
what does all that mean? There's a few things that I would say. One is I do think that there are potentials in us that are uh, potentials in certain structures, patterns that are fairly universal. And that was part of Jung's idea too, right? That mm -hmm. you don't find a culture where a circle signifies fragmentation and brokenness. Mm -hmm. A circle signifies wholeness. Yeah. And so the idea of the collective unconscious is that you go anywhere and you're going to find certain patterns and you're going to find certain e emotional states, you know, that people can recognize laughter. There mm -hmm. aren't cultures where laughter is sadness. Right. Okay, sure. If we're freaked out, anybody can laugh when they're just freaked out, right? But generally, we recognize when somebody's happy. Um, so there are these things that are commonalities, and there are also things that are ecologically dependent. They're, that's natural. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of experiences that a person can have in a cave in Tibet a thousand years ago are very different than a cave in Greece a thousand years ago, mm -hmm. a Christian mystic, right? right? They're different experiences. And yet, mm -hmm. I bet if you got them together, they would say, Okay, yeah, love, yeah, right? Right, right? You know, right. compassion, warmth of heart, <clears throat> openness, presence. Yeah. So what I generally recommend to people is a few things, because this just kind of touches to part of like what's core to my work. Hmm. I believe that just as there is an ethical common ground that we can find across traditions, where, where all, and the Dalai Lama has actually done a lot of work on this, where he has said, we can have a common ground of ethics because even though you think everybody has a different view, everybody understands the importance of love and compassion. It really is. There's no tradition that doesn't have space there and say, okay. And I, I liken this to an ecological commons. What I say is that there is a non-duality of the spiritual and ecological commons. You and I might live along the same river. You've got your beautiful little cabin and your fa nice family and friends and your dog, and you live there, and I live there. And uh, we both know that if you start fouling the river, it's going to affect me. If I start fouling the river, it's going to affect you or somebody downstream from us. So we all agree that the river is a resource we have to take care of. We can each have our private abode, but we have a commons that we need to take care of and respect and revere in common. And that's an ecological commons. We have to recover that idea. We've lost it. But similarly, there's a spiritual commons. You might be in your atheistic, materialistic house. Or I, I, that's not you, but I just mean you yeah, might be in your right. philosophical house. I might be in my, and there's a Buddhist up there, and there's a Jewish family here, and everybody's there. But we all recognize, well, you know, we need to have compassion for one another. Yeah. We need to value wisdom and understand that ignorance is the problem. You aren't my enemy. Ignorance is my enemy. No human being is my enemy. Ignorance is the enemy. And we all need to appreciate the beauty of the world and the beauty of our basic dignity and our capacities. So what I focus on is teaching people what that common ground looks like. And then I encourage them to find a tradition that is either in their ancestral lineage or just resonates with them. That that's really all that matters. So if you know you grew up Christian and you rejected it, it might be that if you learn a little bit about that common ground, you learn a bit even about the potentials that are in that tradition, you might say, well, you know what? Maybe I'm a Christian after all. I didn't know that it wasn't just the stuff that I was told, but there's more there. Or it might be you say, well, I like that Taoist stuff you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it turns out there's a whole Taoist religion and a whole Taoist philosophical practice that's you know very similar in some ways to Buddhist philosophy, right? You, you learn practices and meditation and yoga and you learn all these wonderful things. So yeah, maybe you, that's what you fall in love with. Right. You have to feel drawn to it. You have to fall in love with it and know that if you're committed to wisdom, love, and beauty, we can all get along together. Yeah. You and I could have very different experiences, but we'll know what the sense of wisdom, love, and beauty are. So there's a lot of room for common ground. But you can see that there's a difference between, well, on the one hand, I was saying, well, there's sometimes when there's a proliferation, that's not necessarily cognitive diversity. That might be a lot of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So I was suggesting in a kind of, okay, subtle, I don't want to be too strong about it, but like maybe we have a lot of psychotherapies because we haven't done a very good job understanding the mind in the dominant culture. And people keep trying to say, well, this isn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, maybe the wisdom traditions then have a lot more to offer us. And we might discover that there's more unity than we thought, oh, we thought we needed 50,000 kinds of therapy. Well, maybe we don't need that many. And there maybe there is a little bit of confusion or even a lot of confusion about what the mind is, what the healthy mind is, and how to get there. Hmm. Let, that, let that have its pause for a moment there. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, that was a very full answer because yeah. you did ask a big question. So in my defense, that was a very big question you were asking. No, and I appreciate your answer in being not a thumbnail sketch of, of what, what we're trying to, to uh, unpack here. And I don't really have a response for it. I, I you know, your, your answer uh, can, can rest on that, which, which I'm, I'm sort of slapping myself in a self-deprecating way. Cause I always like to come back and say, well, I, you know, this was salient to me what you said, but really that, that just, uh, I want to, I want to let that uh, be on its own and maybe try to come up with a way to, um, I, I have another question in mind, but I am still trying to search and see if there was something else that came up when you were talking, but I really don't think there was. And it's not, because <laughs> your answer wasn't satisfying. It was no, just more. I can add something though it, that, that yeah. you did something that's related to your uh, question. I, I just yesterday, I think it was posted on LinkedIn a quote from Jung that I think is really beautiful, and he said it in an interview. He said, "The world hangs by a thin thread, and that thread is the human psyche." Hmm. And it's interesting <clears throat> because he's this is, quote was like, you know, 40 years ago, more than that. Oh, my gosh, it must have been. I mean, yeah, he's been dead for almost 60 years. And um, in that quote, he says, well, what if some fellow in Moscow loses his mind and we get we get he launches a, a, a missile. Right. And this is like an actual threat today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but what he says in that quote that he says other places in his work is he says, the psyche, everything depends on the human psyche, and we do not understand the psyche. Now, this is Jung admitting this when he's produced this massive ove, ove of works, right? This beautiful, beautiful collection of reflections on the psyche that I think is so insightful. And he's still saying, but basically, we still don't know it. And he says, I don't know all of it. You know, there are things that I, I think I really do know because I've experienced them. I've seen them help my patients. I've seen them harm my patients, right? I've seen these things at work in the world and in myself. He was a real psychonaut, mm -hmm. really went in. And anybody who doesn't know that, look at the red book and look yeah. at the black books where yeah. you see a guy without taking mushrooms or LSD, he right. goes into the psyche and he has these visionary experiences. And you see that in other wisdom traditions. So Jung in a different tradition just would have been a sage. Yeah. He didn't get the kind of education he needed to do that. Well, that's why I say he's not quite the psychologist Buddha was, but his point stands that we don't know the psyche. Mm -hmm. And even some of our best therapists don't know the psyche. They know things to do that can make you feel better. And no one should discount mental health professionals. I mean, I always emphasize this. These people might save your life, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand the psyche in the way that the wisdom traditions do. Good point. And so that's why it's also a good supplement. And you, you need to ask those questions. Some of us really do need to say, well, do I need a therapist? And it might be because Jung had this wonderful lecture that he delivered called um, Psychotherapy or the Clergy. Mm, and he was mm. talking about like, well, what is it? Because a lot of clergy were so interested because they realized that they were the caretakers of the soul. And mm -hmm. here's this new discipline saying, well, wait, we know a lot of things. And, and so there were clergy studying Jung. And to this day, you will find clergy who become analysts. And similarly, though, you will find clergy who become Buddhist practitioners. And you will find, I mean, actual, there are actual Christian monastics. Yeah. They are monks. They consider themselves Christians, but they have asked their church, I want to go study with the Buddhists because I think they know the path to God. No, yeah. no insult. Yeah, yeah. They just really seem to have a way in. So if we can bring the wisdom traditions and not ignore the things that the dominant culture has discovered, including our religious traditions, I really think we could create that stronger common ground and know more about the psyche than we do now. And Jung is right. The world is hanging by the thread. Whether or not we will find out enough about our own psyche to save ourselves in the world and to feel better and to excel, to realize our potentials. That's important. What a powerful paradox to say that which is everything is something that we don't understand. And it is the only tethering we have to the reality that is circular. It is the psyche. It is, you know, it's our access. You know, none of us have direct access to reality. If I, I'm kind of a representationalist, it's like, you know, I mean, what's what's out there? And this could segue into uh, the question I had for you. But yeah, I want to acknowledge Young's Red Book as his vulnerability, his flirting with uh, what some would say with schizophrenia and and being out there on the edge, uh, maybe from too many years of being immersed in that kind of environment. You know, you talk about the uh, introjection 
uh, earlier as a child of a of Civil War uh, captive that that you know, somehow um, by mysterious means uh, interjected this trauma. And so, yeah, I think Jung may have had that. And there's always transference in psychotherapy and countertransference. God knows what he onboarded and 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 because he, you know, psychoanalysis was in its early fledgling stages. So he really was a psychonaut. He was a pioneer, as was Nietzsche. Nietzsche at the end um, had dissolved into that. And he said, I think, you know, what is the line that uh, if you stare into the abyss, it stares back and you know, watch out <laughs> when that yeah. happens. Uh, so these yeah. are these are the masters that show up to 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 uh, both enlighten us, shine the light and also to uh, present these caveats that you know, like you said, it's a, it's a very fragile thread um, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, so a segue would uh, be to, for perhaps a last, um, guess I can always have you back for more conversations. A last uh, element or segment for this conversation is, and this is a huge one too, is the self-other dichotomy. It is the sense of uh, individuality, as you said, sort of atomistic us, um, and how um, predators will will uh, prey on that by imbuing a sense of individualism, uh, which in its own right, if healthily practiced, is not bad. You know, we have to be individuals. But when we think of Buddhist tradition and we think of Eastern uh, concepts of um, the relationality of that which is whatever this is uh, to the world, um, let's talk to that for a moment, because I think uh, to critique modern, Western, postmodern, metamodern, whatever we, whatever we're doing right now, um, that 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 sense, that strong sense of the I, the strong sense of the um, uh, beingness as uh, uh, an agent of unlimited agency, uh, and how do we again humble ourselves into this uh, concept of connectivity, the concepts of interdependence. Let's talk to that. You know, again, it's a huge thing, but maybe we could we we could work with that for a moment yeah. uh, because I think that's one of the crucial steps that some people can take to to move into wisdom and and love and. Um, oh the, boy, but it's a big one, and I yeah. always uh, also these are I'm kind of like the old type of philosopher is very similar to somebody we would think of as a shaman or something in some ways. Mm -hmm. that the uh, philosopher when we're practicing therapeia then you have like a medicine bag and you pull out your little medicine stone or whatever it might be mm -hmm. and it has the healing energy and so in <clears throat> my philosopher's medicine bag one of the stones that i pull out very frequently is when buddha and i'm, I'm not a buddhist actually you know I, right. I, my my job as a philosopher is you take care of wisdom wherever you find it Mm -hmm. And so it happens to be that I think that Buddha is a really exceptional philosopher. Every time I read this guy, I just can't believe somebody was this insightful. And But at one point, Ananda, who was one of his finest students, this guy was so bright. It's hard for us to, to understand. So we know this exists. But when Buddha taught, after he would give the discourse, because he didn't write anything, like Socrates, he didn't write anything down. But the difference there was that in that culture, since they had such an oral tradition, there were still people who would memorize what people would say. And Socrates, uh, you, in the Platonic dialogues, you find this, like the Phaedrus begins with this young man who is trying to memorize a speech he's just heard somebody else deliver on love. So he's so excited. I mean, we can't even imagine this today. We turn on a, it would be like turning on a TED talk. And then if, you know, somebody saw you the next day and they said, what are you doing? I'm trying to memorize this TED talk that I, that, you know, first he said this oh, yeah. and then she said that, right? And this is what this kid is doing. He wants to memorize it. And so Ananda was acknowledged in the community as being so bright that he was the one who memorized everything Buddha said. And then Buddha would leave and Ananda would go with the, all, all the rest of the students and he would say back the same discourse. And of course, they were there to say, oh, Ananda, I don't know if he said it that way. And then there might be some discussion. But basically, it was he said it and they would then, mm -hmm. after hearing him, try to rememorize it. So he would help it get passed down that way. So okay. this is an exceptional student, an exceptionally bright person and considered one of the top, top students. And one day he's talking, that's important because he says to Buddha, you know, Buddha, this teaching of, of interwovenness. It is so subtle and so profound. And that's like the core teaching that Buddha is trying to get, the interwovenness of all things. And so he says, it's so subtle, it's so profound, and yet it's so clear. 
And Buddha said, never say that, Ananda. It's not clear. If it were clear, people wouldn't suffer. Mm. It is subtle and it is profound mm. and it is difficult to fathom. And I've seen this actually even in live teachings where I've seen somebody say with a, a, a high level Buddhist teacher talk, talking about interwovenness. And they'll say, well, yeah, but I understand the interwovenness. And, the, and I, I've heard a teacher say, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. If you understood it, you would be enlightened. I mean, are you enlightened? You know, the, and this was a, happened to be a person I knew who had an advanced degree. And there again, it's this idea that, well, I've got a PhD. I understand interdependence. Mm -hmm. And uh, this teacher saying, no, if you actually understood it, you wouldn't suffer. Are you, are you free from all suffering? Is that what you want to tell me? Then you teach, you know? I mean, so we really think we understand and we don't. Krishnamurti once, I love that was one of, one of his, he was giving a talk and he said, you know, everybody says, oh, I see, I see. I really wish you would get in the habit of saying, I think I see. Mm. I probably don't really. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. So in terms of your question, this is so profound then, because in if the world, if we begin to say, well, yes, it is an interwoven universe. Everything's relational. How do I even understand self? How do I understand intention? If it's relationality and interwovenness all the way down, how do I understand intention? One of the ways that we can touch this is relates to our last discussion. If you have a, a, a jazz musician who's competent, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's a professor, they're a pro. Yeah. They know they can go to any gig and they're going to play competently. It's going to be good. Nobody's going to say, I want my money back. That's crap. Yeah. <laughs> but then they will also say, there are rare occasions where you are swinging from the chandeliers of heaven itself. And if somebody plays it back to you, you say, I don't know how I did that. Mm -hmm. And the, the answer is, of course, that you didn't. And Nietzsche sensed this too, that see, I, I wrote an essay. There's a, he has this idea of the sovereign individual and it's so dominant culture, the sovereign individual. And there yeah. are even self-help gurus out there teaching you how to take your sovereignty and become a sovereign individual. And they don't know that if this concept really comes from Nietzsche, but typical of Nietzsche, he is actually critiquing it. But when you read it, you have to really think to see that he's critiquing it. Okay. It looks like he's endorsing. And everybody, everybody, every time I've ever read with anybody or been in a graduate seminar, almost everybody thinks the sovereign individual, this is Nietzsche's great idea, and they want to be one. Mm -hmm. But it's very clear, actually, that Nietzsche understood if the universe is interwoven, then the times when I feel most myself are the times when I feel I didn't do it. <laughs> right? Yeah, That's yeah. the Wu Wei, also from the flow state, okay. right? That's what mm -hmm. Zhuangzi is saying when he's teaching us the non doing. He's saying, if you want to realize the pinnacle of what you're capable of, you have to reach the place where you're not the one doing what's happening. And that's not an erasure of the self. It's mm -hmm. not like you don't exist, you're yeah. nothing. It is this impossible non duality of self and world. Mm -hmm. And that's just a paradox. It is actually, and, and well, I once wrote a paper where there's a well-known scholar of Chinese philosophy, I mean, very big guy. And he was saying, well, you know, Wu Wei isn't really a paradox because this was a commonly, people would, would say, well, it seems like it's paradoxical. The Zhuangzi is trying to say it's paradoxical and very deliberately so. He said, no, it's not paradoxical. And so I, I wrote an article where I tried to demonstrate that clearly, it was like a kind of entertaining thing to do, right? The, the guy who's so famous and you kind of say, well, I don't agree with you because mm -hmm. I'm not the same level of scholar. I was never, a, I, technically, I'm not a scholar of Chinese philosophy. So, but I wrote this paper and there were other philosophers who agreed who were scholars of Chinese philosophy who said, yeah, that's, you know, but you, you take your own stand. But my view is that it is a paradox. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so therefore you aren't going to conceptually really understand it even though, so there's a difference. And this, actually, you touched on on, on this notion in, in, in our last dialogue too. You were talking about how maybe we never are in contact with reality. Mm -hmm. See, Buddha disagrees with Kant there. See, Kant says there's the thing in itself and you'll never know the thing in itself. Right. And Buddha would say, yeah, but that's like saying there's a gap between you and reality. Right, right. You have to already be reality. And though you can't conceptually encompass it, you actually can, I use the word wonderstand. It's mm. not understand. You stand under a concept. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And then if you stand under something long enough, you, you never know what will happen, right? <laughs> right, so right. If you're if you understand, you're still in conceptual territory. But, but what Buddha presents us with, and Zhuangzi too, and many other philosophers, I think Socrates too, presents us with the possibility that we can wonderstand. That is to say, we have real wisdom about it and we can work with it. That's another definition of wisdom, would be skillful interwovenness. Mm -hmm. Skillful okay. interwoven. We're skillfully in that interwovenness. And we, we really do understand it, but we'll never be able to give a set of concepts that will encompass it. Yeah, It will always have something that is not captured by the concepts. We can't lock it down that way. Yeah. So I do think you can arrive at the insight and we need to erase that duality between human and nature because it's what's causing us so many problems. Mm -hmm. That's what our problem is. We think we're separate from the world and, and we don't see that what we do matters and that the world depends on us to live well so that oh, the whole community of life can live well and vice versa. Yeah. I can't be sovereign if the wolves are not sovereign in Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. Their sovereignty and my sovereignty are to so interwoven that I can't say whose is whose. Yeah. That's why wolves appear as archetypal beings because I want the spirit of wolf thinking itself through me. That's a weird thing to say in our culture. Yeah. But you you can't be sovereign if I'm not. I mean, if you imprison me and oppress me, you're not really mm -hmm. sovereign. You may think yeah, you are. Right. right. So there is this thing that we have to understand, how we are together in a non-duality that doesn't erase the self, but also just doesn't remain egocentric. And I like what you just said about, like, if I held you prisoner, I could be a raging sociopath and not feel a thing for your suffering, but underlying that i am still inheriting that trauma and that um existential malaise that comes with that and it will i believe out itself in another way it may compound the sociopathy you know it may manifest as self-harm whatever but yeah i don't think there is a cost-free exchange in that sense and that speaks again lightly to the interdependence and when you were talking about the paradox i've always had this sort of casual thought experiment that I do for myself and I share it with anybody and I'll pass it on to you right now is that when I think about being non-being self non-self I think about the fact that I can do a thought experiment saying that I am nothing but hydrogen carbon nitrogen sulfur this body me is in no way distinct from the universe it is these elements and so i'll be get reductionist for a moment but you know it's, it's these elements but nonetheless there is this boundary this markov blanket that that interacts with the world as a markov blanket would do and 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 so so we have to acknowledge that so that's the paradox for me is that i am not essentially a being from a from a perspective like the moon's perspective would see me as just being another element of the universe another thing that you know, happens to be animated, happens to be biological, but it is just these constituencies that have organized and are doing something ephemerally, fighting off the second law of thermodynamics for 10, 20, 50, 80 years, however long we live. Uh, but also in the selfness, in the psyche, which I would use as synonymy with ensoulment, uh, is where is the locus, as you said earlier, where is the locus of that? And in that dance of their beingness, in, in what we would colloquially colloquially call this the the physical self uh which again i think is from the moon's perspective you know almost a non-starter you know like 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 we have to as a useful fiction acknowledge that we are these living beings so i'm getting deeper into my my weirdness but that's what i do for myself to ground myself in the sense that i am at once a being and a self but i am not a being and a self and and i hold that tension and oscillation and an appropriateness and so that there are times so when somebody has a non-dual experience, I think that maybe they are oscillating into that sort of, am I? Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 you know, I, you know, there's the null, the null subjectivity of language. Like there is no way every language has the first person account. It, some of it is less, lesser degrees. So I'll stop there because I could go on forever on my little weird tangent. But like I said, that's my thought experiment is that I am this composition of nothing more than that, which is already already here already around but i will acknowledge that this is an animated you know uh, biological system and again where is the locus of the psyche and the soul in that and i have to have that humility that it's you know i can't touch that i can't i can't speak to that it's, yeah well that's an that's, that's an epistemic humility i guess well it is of course yeah, yeah. um epistemic ontological
Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, I mean, there are a couple of things going on. One is, the so first thing I'll say is that when I work with people, the the paradox that I, because we, we were talking about Wu Wei in particular, and for me, this is so essential to philosophy. And the p- paradox is, and this is why I, I, mean, I, I work with people a lot online, especially post COVID, but, but mm-hmm. there's, so there's so much that can be done. But in person, one of the things that we will work with is the simple activity of getting in and out of a chair. Mm. Because the paradox of non-doing is this. I want you to get out of the chair, but I don't, but you can't do anything to get out of the chair. Now, this is a re- really ridiculous thing yeah. to hear, but it has, and this is the difference between uh, say trying to understand something and understand it. When you experience the non-doing of getting out of a chair, it really blows your mind. Mm. And you say, wait a second, I didn't do it, but we're so used to doing it. And when you confront that paradoxical space of don't try, but let it happen, it's amazing. And you find that there is this little doer in you who you you can't actually find them. You just sense their effect. So that relates to the other thing you're saying, which is, well, can you find a doer? That's Mm -hmm. what, what part of what Nietzsche's paradox is and the one that you were talking about. You can't find the doer. And your analysis is just an updated version of Buddha's. Remember, mm-hmm. because that's what Buddha did. Yeah. He presents you with an analysis. The, so the aggregates are the heaps. The, so he literally used five heaps and he said, okay, there's the form aggregate. That's the body and all of its stuff. Mm-hmm. There's the sensations and perceptions and and uh, volitions. Okay, so there's form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. And each one of these, he says, is a heap. In other words, today we would say it's a system. Mm -hmm. So there's a system of systems. And if you look inside any one of those systems, look at the body. Do you find the self? Do you find the doer? No. Look in your consciousness. Do you find the doer in there? No, you can't find a doer. There's not, the self isn't an object. And what Nargajuna did, and this was how uh, the great philosopher Sankapa woke up, was reading this line and and, uh, another philosopher named Buddha Palita's commentary on it. But Nargajuna says the self is not the aggregates and it's also not other than the aggregates, mm-hmm. which means to say that sometimes you would think, well, then it's it must be all of them together, or it must be an extra thing that's on top of them, and but you can't find it there either. The point is, though, this analysis and this inability to find the self, and yet realizing that you're also not nothing because that doesn't make any sense. You can't say, I'm nothing. Well, where is that? Show me it. Where's the nothing, right? So you're having experience, and yet you can't find this, the experiencer. And that's also a kind of weird paradox. There's a way in which wisdom is increasing tolerance for the inability to find a doer of your life and an increasing openness to letting wisdom, love, and beauty be the doer of your Mm, life mm, mm. in a way that doesn't erase you or make you schizophrenic. It's the realization of what, what you are. You feel more yourself at those moments than you do anytime you're efforting. And what a wonderful freedom when you can just even begin to start apprehending that or holding that in your figurative grasp uh, that, you know, you you don't have to completely reform or reconfigure your relationship with selfness, otherness, and uh, objectivity. So uh, one guy I follow uses the word transjective. So there is this liminal space of the subject object relationship. And again, I like reciprocal or, or um, um, what do they say? Oscillatory patterns. You know, you learn to recognize the Hertz of the oscillatory. So, so you can move in different Hertz uh, values, you know, you, you, so, so I think this is a, a nice heuristic for us maybe to, to understand these seeming paradoxes, but we're, we're lensing it from a certain perspective. And, and that's one of the ways of knowing is perspectival knowing. Well, a perspective shift is always possible and available to us. And that's the work that you're doing. And, you know, if, if, if one can um, temporarily unground oneself to be in that fluid state to then just sort of reground or, or um, not even reground, but, but just to anchor yourself again in, in, in a broader context, you know, maybe, maybe that's a, a helpful kickstart for someone to, uh, to do that. Um, but now, you speak in one of the podcasts that sh- on your podcast channel, which again, links will be down below. You speak to the delusional self. Let's let's address that now. That now that we've talked about, well, we know how to dissolve this, or well, we can think about dissolving the self. We don't know. We, we can think about it maybe abstractly. Uh, 
we do construct ourselves and reconstruct ourselves and 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 put up defenses and protections and you know egoic kind of structure um and I guess we could say maybe some of that's necessary and healthy for, for functionality, but also it can go into either subclinical manifestations or again, to, to pretend to know anything about psychology, it could be pathological. If you want yeah, to maybe course. touch on that, like the op it's almost the opposite of the, of the self, no self um, yeah. par paradigm. And then we'll move into the, the I am's, you know, the strong I am's of, of, um, of attachment to a personality or a persona or an ego. Mm -hmm. So the way that the, the traditions, that there's a lot of agreement across traditions that ignorance is the problem. Now, there you could say there's two different kinds of ignorance. One kind where I don't know what's off camera from you. I, I don't know what's over on your far right side or far left side. Well, that's not usually the ignorance that causes the real problem that the wisdom traditions are worried about. Instead, it's the what you could call active misknowing. Mm. I actively know the wrong thing. Mm. So like simple example would be, I actively know that the Mexicans are coming across the border and destroying America, right? So that's not an example of just, I don't know what is going on in Mexico. It's I actively know that the Mexicans are, are, are causing problems, right? So that's like it's when it, when somebody has a clearly racist or, or biased view, we, we understand, right, okay, right. yeah, that's a problem. But, but what the wisdom traditions are saying is that you are actively misknowing your whole reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is the encumbered sense of ego. It, and th they don't all have say that, well, you have to get rid of the ego. There's plenty of, you know, there's a, like when you call Jesus or Buddha, you say, hey, Jesus, hey, Buddha, they turn their head. I mean, it's not like they don't know where they're at or what, right, you know, like they right. can't cross the street because cars will hit them, you know, because it's all one. I mean, they're not lost in this, okay, I don't exist thing. It's just that they're not hooked and they're no longer engaged in this active misknowing of reality mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that's our problem and sometimes the way people put it is uh, or I, I guess there's a, a a quote falsely attributed to twain that's something like this mark twain it's not what you don't know it's the things you know for certain that are conscious right yeah mm -hmm. um and that's our problem and so yeah. we're very certain about time space and identity we have these certainties that i'm an atomized individual and uh we don't understand this interwovenness because it can't, it's not an object of knowledge in an ordinary sense. So you were touching on that too, just that, well, somehow or other, the reality is not quite subjective, not quite objective. It's relational. So that means it can't be totally objective because how I relate to the. Your Nico's your sound cut out for just a second. So if you hear me. I'll hit pause for just a second here. Oh. Okay. So weird Zoom thing there, but um, so the idea is that somehow or other, it's it's not subjective and not objective. Buddha had this insight that is, in a way, he was referring to his own mental processes, but because of the interwovenness of things, he was referring to everything. When he when he is describing the big insight. The way he describes it is that is like that because this is like this. Mm -hmm. And this is like this because that is like that. Now mm -hmm. imagine pointing at a tree and saying that, okay, that tree, it doesn't exist from its own side. Mm -hmm. That is like that because this is like this. Mm -hmm. We can see that in our world because if you, if you, I live in California here, I'm in the Maxaraja, the Santa Cruz mountains, and you can see uh, trees dying from the heat and drought. Well, why is it like that? Well, because of the way I live and the way other human beings live. So that tree is the way it is because I am the way I am. But I can't live without that tree making oxygen, shaping the atmosphere, the weather. Mm -hmm. If there were more trees, there might be more rain, right? All these things. And it's not it's so intimate that it's like there's this comfortable level where we, we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. And that's the moment when you're saying, I understand interwovenness. And Buddha is saying, no. Because when you really, really see it, it blows your mind and there's just nothing left. And you realize that you're never going to be able to explain this to anybody. And all you can do is 
live the best life you can. And that's what he did. He just invented a way of life and had other, I mean, because this guy, he lives it. He doesn't say, well, you know, now I'm enlightened. You guys go beg for food and bring it back to me. And, you know, yeah. no, he goes and he begs for food. He lives on one meal a day. Right. right. And he goes through all this effort of helping people realize this incredibly wondrous thing that we all are. We are this reality. All we have to do is see it and stop knowing ourselves the wrong way. Be nice if you could just say what that is. Oh, here's the concept. Just know this. It doesn't work. You have to stop the act of misknowing. Yeah. And I'm glad he walked his walk because had he taken advantage of that, uh, it would have just been another cult and we wouldn't be having as much of this conversation as we're having <laughs> because yeah. I've seen that happen in modern times. Somebody starts out with a good idea, good intentions, everybody kind of uh transfers or projects deism you know a deification onto this person suddenly they're like oh i am god you know <laughs> and then it's just a sh shit show after that so yeah, yeah. Here, here's here's to the buddha grounding himself and uh and and staying uh, um uh with his focus in 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 the right direction which you know again it comes back it speaks to this idea that you know you uh you can access this wisdom and you can live the wisdom and and for me and you can you can challenge me on this i i think a lot of things arise within us so that wisdom can arise within us i might i'm saying this probably for the audience and and it, it could be ephemeral it could be that you then uh in another frame of of experience um you may not be so wise you may make a, a imprudent decision or, or so 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 i think when we talk about wisdom it is not this static thing that bam, all of a sudden you're wise, you know? And I think, so in other words, I, I, I joke sometimes, I think you could really piss off the Dalai Lama. He's a wise man, but you could put him through some kind of stress and he'll get grumpy and foul and look like the Tasmanian devil for a few minutes. You know, I think we're all capable of that and we need to hold that and acknowledge it. And I may be a little bit, you know, uh, silly here, but I just, maybe that's another idea when we talk about wisdom, that it is this thing that's within us uh when we when we practice and we aspire to it that um we can be allowed to have those days when we're not as wise and and we didn't make that right decision i so in other words that may <clears throat> liberate us from this tension of i must always be wise and i must always make uh those prudent <clears throat> right calculations and things like that so if, if it's you want tricky we have to look <laughs> we're get, we ha i think we have to embrace our fallibility now <clears throat> i will say the traditions disagree with you that you now as far as the Dalai Lama the Dalai Lama says I'm not the Buddha right he's not he says I'm not enlightened mm -hmm. so he's would be happy now here's a, a cup two things though to keep in mind so one is the traditions do say in fact Bob Thurman makes this joke sometimes he said look if you want to know if one of these uh, gurus is enlightened just go step on his toe real hard Right, you know, right. go oh, go ask him a question. Now he's not really serious that you should do this, but you know, like go ask him a question. Just like really, really come down on his toe. If he's totally fine, maybe he is. Mm -hmm. But his view is the traditions, and and you see this in Socrates. One of the things that you find in the symposium that Alcibiades says is Socrates is always the same guy. Mm -hmm. you, you get him, you know, like I, I get him in private and try to get him to be different and no go mm. the guy is the, what you see is what you get and so right. finally um um in, at least maybe the dalai lama is not enlightened but i will say this paul ekman famous researcher on emotions human emotions and we were talking in the last thing about uh, last episode about uh, whether what things are cross-cultural was sort of like implicit in one of your questions mm -hmm. and ekman tried to show that there are basic emotions that everybody in the world recognizes if you show right. a, a smiling person you say what is this person feeling it doesn't matter where you go somebody will say well they're happy and so Ekman became super famous for studying micro expressions. And then there was even this show that was done about him with Tim Roth. I think mm -hmm. it was called like Liar or something. But mm -hmm. Tim Roth plays the Paul Ekman character who can tell when someone's lying because of these micro expressions. And you can actually get trained to read micro expressions. But okay. they came up because Ekman did realize that there were people in law enforcement. Some of them were really good at detecting deception. Now, of course, every cop thinks that they're good and then this causes problems. So let's bracket that. But what Ekman did find is that emotionally sensitive people can notice when someone is, is there a little flash, it's called a micro expression because it happens like a snap of the fingers. It's so quick that something flashes over that face that is not in accord with what they're saying. 
And that's when you know something funny is going up. You actually can't be sure they're lying. They might right. be embarrassed. They might be uncomfortable. Yeah. But the point is, is that if someone is telling you, I love you, and then suddenly there's this flash, if you're quick enough to see it, you realize, okay, something's not right. Mm. So Ekman said, I have met all kinds of people. And it's funny because so they, they had these annual conferences called Mind and Life Conferences where the scientists get together with the Dalai Lama and you know he loves to he loves science. He loves to hear all their findings. They tell him all these findings. He asks some questions and stuff. And it's just a way for the scientists to get together. And they also learn from the Buddhists, the ones who are in mind science. Of course, the physicists aren't learning anything from, from the Buddhists, but the psychologists were. So then people said, well, hey, let's have Paul come this year. I mean, he's expert in emotions. The Dalai Lama would love his work. And somebody said, oh, man, but Paul, he's such a hard-nosed scientist. You know, it's the Dalai Lama. He's not going to, he's going to think, oh, this guy's just some guru, you know. Right, right. And uh, and so, but then the other scientists said, no, the Dalai Lama would never want you to not invite somebody because you thought they were going to be skeptical about him. He's that not that kind of guy. Yeah. So he'll be fine with it. Invite him. So Paul Ekman goes, meets the Dalai Lama. And basically falls in love. I mean, they mm. became besties. Okay. And here's what Ekman said. He said, every human being, I've met all kinds, I've studied faces my whole career, right? This is the first human being I have ever met who, for whom what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Never did this guy ever say one thing and express something different in his face. Mm. So maybe you could get him upset, but he wouldn't hide it. Yeah, yeah. He would just yeah. be upset. And one of the things Ekman said is he said, you know, one time I heard him, I, somebody asked him a question about something that was happening in, in the world. And it was very, very emotional thing. It was really painful. And I watched this guy stand there, weep, and then let it go and say, we need to talk about what we can do about this. Mm -hmm. He felt what he was feeling. Yeah. And yeah. then he, he shifted and let it go. So there are these potentials for us. And you're right, though, at the same time, if we try to be perfectionistic, the issue is to not lie if you're angry, right, to right, not repress right. the anger and to not act out of the anger. That's part of what we need to do. And to be able to say, I'm not in the state of being in which wisdom, love and beauty are likely to function through me. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I need to take a walk. I need to go listen to some podcasts about philosophy, right? Or something. right? And I need to kind of clear my mind and let wisdom, love, and beauty have their opportunity. Yeah. Now is not the time for me to act. Yeah. And again, uh, no, uh, no intention to disparage the Dalai Lama. It was just sort of a, you know, <laughs> no, hy so hyperbo laugh. silly yeah. hyperbolic <laughs> example. But yeah, and 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 I think he, if he were on this call, he would say, yeah, I can get pissed off. I have grumpy days. I, you know. I'm I'm not above that, and maybe you know yeah. I don't know if I could speak for Jesus or the Buddha. Yeah. Well, I mean, Christ had his moments. You know, he he. You know, why have you forsaken me? You know, he's he's having this crisis, yes, uh, and in his darkest hour. So yeah, so so yeah. again it, to the audience, yeah, no, no, no disparagement meant to the Dalai Lama. It's, it's just a, a good example thing. that he is yeah. a he's a symbol of um um maybe an awake awakened one, maybe the ninth heir to the red hat dynasty of Buddhism. I don't know, but you know, he is uh, someone we all look up to as being that steadfast wise person who dispenses uh, the, the, again, the core values of, of the wisdom tradition. So again, that was just meant to, to, to use as an example that the rest of oh, us yeah. can feel relieved that if we have a crappy day, <laughs> like I do a lot, you know, it's, and, and, but I, I, like you said, I move through it. I'm honest and, 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 and I'm fallible and I do my thing. And then I try to come back to a center, to an unflappable state uh, that was ready for the next flap. You know? <laughs> yeah. And the thing is about these traditions, I mean, yeah, I, I really, I took no offense. I just, I, I'm defending the idea that the traditions do claim that a fully awakened person would be free of yeah. these things. Mm -hmm. But, and also what I see in my clients and what you see from anybody who practices philosophy is you can find in your own experience that things that used to get you out, bent out of shape yeah. don't yeah. and what that allows you to imagine is well you know what it must it must be possible i used to fly off the handle if somebody did something like that okay. now that didn't bother me at all and i'm not deceiving myself right you know and so i see this with clients all the time where things that would throw them for a loop they they just handle them with more and more grace mm -hmm. and wow that is a breath of fresh air to know that these teachings could strengthen us and actually they don't strengthen us they reveal our strength it's mm -hmm. like both at the same time in a way. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. So that's important to know that we can improve. We could be radically transformed and healed from some of these things that grip us. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, 
we've almost chewed through another hour. What I'd like to do <laughs> is then offer you uh, a final thought or something that you feel may help uh, with the completion of this conversation or with a, a, a tying in uh, or, or, or something new. We can, I mean, we could keep going a little longer, but yeah, let's, let's go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll ask you to share something or, or bring something forward that uh, you think would be uh, important or relevant for, for what we've been discussing. Yeah, well, let's close with that thought, that philosophy really can heal and transform self and world at the same time. And if you want to find out how to do that, I really recommend, I think more people don't know about compassion and the real practice of it than do. So as an example of a philosophical concept and practice that can really heal your life, go to dangerouswisdom.org. We'll have a link here for the resources page and the meditation section on that page. And then you will see free downloadable tracks a basic introduction to compassion, what it is, how it differs from empathy, mm -hmm. then basic instructions to begin the practice of compassion, and then a three-minute meditation and also a 20-minute. Start with the three-minute meditation, and it can begin to change your life. There's no way you can do something every day and not have it change you. We've got good, what's wonderful about some of these practices from the wisdom traditions is you have 2,600 years of, of really refinement and people mm -hmm. verifying that it works Buddha was very much an empiricist, more even more of one than Socrates. And you also now have the lens of dominant culture science saying, yeah, this makes changes. And so Barbara Fredrickson's work, we mentioned Richie Davidson, but Barbara Fredrickson looked at this practice in particular, and she found that, uh, yeah, it really, if you do it every day, it, it really makes changes. So that's what I recommend. Start there, see how it can change your life, and then just keep learning about philosophy. Listen to Justin's podcast. He's got good thoughts. He's a good thinker. He brings on interesting people, and there are a lot of good resources. We live in a time where we have access to so much good wisdom. Yeah. So don't deny it for yourself, you know, find out more and you can ask me or put, yeah, put comments here, talk to us yeah. and uh, let us know if you want recommendations on what to read, study, listen to next. We're here yeah. for you, right? Yeah, no, you speak to the, to the um, constituency of my guests and interlocutors that I want to bring people forward on to this little show of mine and my little part of YouTube uh, to, to do this uh, wisdom um, surveillance, you know, wisdom uh, 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 salience, and sense-making, meaning-making, and purpose discovery that is done in a positive affect the true, the good, and the beautiful, or the wise, the love, and the beauty. Uh, this is this is the meat and potatoes. Uh, well, let's skip the meat. I, I don't eat meat much anymore. So, so the, the veggies and potatoes of, uh, of what I think uh, would help humanity, especially younger people. And I think if we get together for another conversation, maybe we could come out of the gate talking about Gen Z, about the, um, what I tend to agree with Baudrillard and the hyper-reality, like uh, people are living on their devices and platforms and, and social media and so forth. And and what are the implications? So maybe we could set that up as a teaser for the audience if I bring you back, if that's something you do wish to talk about, uh, is, is what's going on with our future uh, by way of people under 40 and under 30 and so forth. Um, so if that's appealing to you, I'll invite you back and we'll have you in and we can do that and a whole lot more. <laughs> so, so Nikos, thank you so much. And, and I do thank appreciate you. you uh, yeah. I appreciate your kind words uh, saying that this show uh, is trying to execute these, these well-intended uh, practices and, and, and insights. So thank you for that um, to the audience. Thank you. Those of you who are, are still with us in the conversation, two parts, two hours, uh, a lot to unpack, a lot to think about. So um, I hope there's value in it for you. I hope uh, uh, traje trajectories can be uh, altered in a, in a positive way by what Nikos does and any of my previous guests. So thank you all so much. Nikos, I'll say goodbye to you after I stop record, but to the YouTube audience, thank you guys so very much. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.